Hi, welcome to the Nato Happy Hour. Um, we're pretty thrilled to start off uh, this happy hour virtually. Uh, everyone raise a glass at your homes uh, or offices, wherever you may be. Um, and we're pleased to start off with the Innovation and Data Dissemination Award. I'm Craig Schneider, I'm a managing director at IMPAC International and uh, have been on the programs committee for the NATO conference for a number of years. And oh, there is the award that we are speaking of. Yep, so Craig, I've taken this out of the box. I'm gonna hand so, it to uh, you. We're really thrilled to give this award to the Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative. The Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative is a nonprofit public-private collaborative whose mission is to facilitate the adoption of electronic health record systems and health information exchange. The organization was founded in 2005 with a 50, that's five zero million dollar contribution from Blue, Cra Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and support from the Massachusetts Medical Society and the state chapter of the American College of Physicians. The Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative launched pilot projects in three Massachusetts communities to demonstrate the costs and benefits of electronic health record systems and HIE, and to evaluate the options to expand these systems on a statewide basis. Now, you have to remember, this was several years prior to the enactment of the High Tech Act, and this demonstration project was hugely influential on the national health IT and HIE policy and on other states' policies. Following the pilot project, the eHealth Collaborative built on its experience to create a data warehouse and serve as the regional extension center in neighboring states. During its 15-year history, the eHealth Collaborative's leadership modeled health IT best practices, policy innovation, interoperability standards development, and thought leadership on a nationwide basis. And when I was at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, we gained great benefit from their partnership and contributions to the Massachusetts healthcare system. And although it was announced in June that the Massey Health Collaborative is winding down its operations, uh, NADA was pleased to recognize this organization's seminal role and contributions to health data with the 2020 Innovation Data Dissemination Award. Please join me in congratulating its current chairman of the board, Dr. Larry Garber, and its founding president and CEO, Mickey Trapathy. I've worked closely with both of these gentlemen for the past, hard to believe, 14 years, and it is truly my honor to give them this award on behalf of the Massachusetts eHealth Collective. Thank you. Well, thank, well, thank, thank you, thank you, Craig. Thank you. And I, I do hear an echo. If uh, if you're not speaking, it, that's great. Thank you. Um, well, I was really concerned when when Nado uh, said that they were going to send the award through the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Postal Service. However, I did speak However, with the mailman uh, when he when he brought this uh, today. And he confirmed that uh, he pays attention to not mail more than he does pallet. So I really am <laughs> very thankful. Uh, and actually, you can't imagine how thankful we are uh, that you uh, gave us this award. Again, uh, if you're if you do have your microphone on, um, you have your microphone on. So. Honestly, you can't imagine how much this means to us because you know that, you know, you heard from Craig that we've done a lot of things over the last 15 years. You know, we've we've been promoting healthcare uh, data aggregation and dissemination to improve quality, safety, and efficiency uh, throughout healthcare. Um, we've been improving the lives of, of millions of patients, uh, thousands of healthcare workers and payers. Uh, we, we implemented the first, you know, electronic uh, community-wide EHR uh, data network. Uh, we, the work that we did was the basis for uh, meaningful use, you know, the $40 billion program. 
uh, event notification services, uh, you know, quality data reporting publicly and uh, throughout the nation. And with all of those things that we were done, we've done, we, you know, we've been very proud of our work. Um, so, but you may have also heard that, um, you know, we're going to be closing up shop at the end of this year. Uh, our our work is done, uh, you know, and others are are moving forward. Uh, so, as we planned the closing of shop, we decided that well, we should have a you know a, a memorial or like a little museum of the things that we've done, you know, the artifacts from you know our 15 years uh, in in business, and uh, we figured we'd make a, a little showcase, a display case to show uh, our awards. And then we realized that we have never won an award. In the 15 years that we've been in business and doing all these great things, Nado, you are the first award that we have ever, ever received. And we are so thankful because otherwise we would have had an empty showcase. So, so as I told you, this means more to us than you can imagine. Um, this, this will be our most visible tribute to our legacy. Um, in addition to this, we, we do want to thank uh, some other people, basically my mother, our mothers, uh, you know, the people who made this possible. Uh, so that would be the American College of, of Physicians, you know, doctors Alan Goral and David Bates uh, for their, you know, vision of interconnected healthcare uh, that led to the creation of Mayhek in the first place. Uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield for their, for their generous funding and support of Mayhek from the very beginning. Um, and then, of course, the Mass Medical Society, uh, who uh, um, you know has yeah, been our home for the last, for the last 15 years, years. And, and and also, also uh, they, uh, they they help uh, uh, set up uh, uh, house our data, data centers, centers for many, for many years. years. Um, and then, of course, there are all the member organizations of Mayhek that uh, led guidance over the years. Um, and then, last but not least, the, the Mayhek team, who actually, who actually made, made things happen. happen. You know, under, no, the, under leadership the leadership of Mickey Kripathy, who I think we'll hear from shortly. Something that is audio work. And Chris and Matarazzo, Matarazzo. Um, they, they, the two of them, them ran, ran the ship, ship and did an extraordinary job, job uh, which, made which made this all possible. possible. So, thanks so thanks to everyone, to everyone and, 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 and Nato, thank, thank you so much. Hey, Mickey, hey, Mickey. Hey. Great. Can you see and hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you just fine. Oh no. We, we have, have okay. Okay. Hello. Can you see and hear me? Okay. Great. Um so I just want to thank, I'm going to try to go through this fast because who knows how long I have this connection. Um, I just want to thank Nato as well uh, for this prestigious award. We're really deeply honored by your, your support and recognition. Um, I just wanted to, you know, reflect a little bit on the, you know, what we've experienced. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. the unpredictable nature of Wi-Fi and internet connections around the country. I was going to say, if only we had a technology expert in the house. Do either of you have any idea what he was going to say? Let's do this. Let's uh, have the rest of us try to turn our videos off and see if that helps preserve some matter.
Mickey, are you there? Okay, I, I think I can see you now. Okay. Yes, yes, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> so who knows how long this is going to last? So I'll try to talk fast. Um, I just just reflecting a little bit on you know on our experience with Massio Collaborative. Uh, you know we started off in a very unorthodox way, as um, as I think uh, you know was mentioned in the introduction. We started off with a lot of money, um, but not necessarily a lot of sanity. Um, <laughs> and the reason I say that is because we embarked on these. Um, these pilot projects in three markets, and they were designed more as a technology experiment. Um, you know, we, you, you know, any sane person entering this space would, you know, say you should first start with a set of goals and a strategy for what you want to accomplish from a business and a policy perspective, and then figure out how you engineer the technology and implement the technology to um, support that. We actually did it a little bit, you know, sort of in a in a um, different vein, where what we were trying to do was um, sort of conduct an experiment to see what happens if you just deployed technology and what will be the impact of a targeted technology inter intervention holding all the other variables constant. And I know that seems a little bit bizarre now as you think about it, but you have to reflect back on you know 2004 where we really were in a stalemate in the industry in terms of fig trying to figure out how people were going to feel that there was enough business imperative and clinical imperative for them to invest in um, electronic health records, which you know are uh, non-trivial um, investment. <clears throat> so we ended up, you know, moving forward, implementing EHRs in 600 among 600 ambulatory providers and 200 office locations in three markets, connected them up with health information exchanges in each market, and then built a data warehouse on top of all of that to measure the effects of our interventions on quality and cost. Um, and, you know, we learned a ton of lessons along the way that I hope have helped to inform the industry. Um, some of those represent successes that we had. Um, at least as many, I think, represent abject failures <laughs> um, on our part that we hope others will learn from and not, you know, not sort of repeat those. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll group these into, you know, sort of three categories just to, just to you know, offer something of a structure here. Um, and I've, you know, kind of put those into three, you know, sort of um, uh, general themes. One is, you know, we learn very quickly, you can't live on EHRs alone. Um, the second is that, you know, poor data quality is the other pandemic failure that our country is, is totally ill-equipped to solve. And then the last is um, regarding, um, you know, data and the use of it. And that, you know, if a data tree falls in the woods and no one's there to see it, it really doesn't exist. And, you know, we've, we sort of learned lessons along the way on all of these. The first with EHRs, you know, we kind of started with the assumption that the EHR would provide the central tooling for improving healthcare, and that all we needed to do was feed the EHR with the right data from health information exchanges, and the EHRs would clean it all up and build in logical analytics and deliver robust quality measurement and localized decision support, and we quickly discovered that that just wasn't the case. The EHRs couldn't be all things to all people keeping up with the workflows needed for clinical documentation, revenue cycle management, and point of care integration, which was their primary focus, was hard enough. And to expect that they were also gonna build the ability to do analytics, to be able to bring data in from disparate sources, um, and then to develop the workflows to be able to you know, sort of serve that um, population health type of need was, you know, it turned out you know, too much of an ask. Um, so that was one lesson that we learned that this data warehouse that we had built was actually going to be um, you know, sort of fundamentally important to everything that we were trying to accomplish from with respect to health information technology. Um, the second issue is is related to data quality. Um, yeah, I was the prior to coming to the Nasio Collaborative, I was I was the founding CEO of the Indiana Health Information Exchange, and I learned some really deep lessons there from Dr. Clem McDonald, who many of you may know is sort of a legendary architect and informatics pioneer. And one of the things, you know, he he, um, he found in building the system in Indianapolis was that it was impossible to build a robust data enterprise assuming adherence to standards at the edge, meaning assuming that the source systems were going to deliver good quality data to you. And as a result, he ended up flipping his model and building a heavy infrastructure at the center to clean up that data. And that was a lesson that, you know, in, in seeing that in Indiana, you know, moved it here to, to the Massiel Collaborative and realized that, you know, we were going to have to be at the role of cleaning up data and making it useful um, rather than assuming that it was going to be perfect coming in. 
So, um, so that was a, you know, that was a part of what we ended up building was an infrastructure and a team that would validate, cleanse, normalize, and curate data because our system is just too fragmented and has no top-down authority to drive strict adherence to standards as much as we tried. And even with meaningful use, we've seen that that is, you know, sort of has, has gotten us a certain degree down the road, but it didn't get us all the way there. And, and, doesn't you know sort of um, uh, you know preclude the, the the need to be able to um, curate data and and make it higher quality for the purposes of analytics. Um, we also learned along the way in the area of data quality the fallacy of what I would call the one stop shop approach to data aggregation. Our original architecture assumed that we would have a data warehouse sitting on top of the three HIEs that we were building. And that you could basically sort of say, well, we're collecting data for one purpose in those HIEs, and we can use it for multiple things. We'll use it for point of care decision making, and we'll use it for data analytics. Um, what we found is that you know data is a byproduct of a clinical or business process, and so data made available for a primary HIE use case, which is point of care, diagnostic, and treatment decision making, is similar, but in significantly different critical aspects, it's different than the data that you need for robust analytics. And we quickly found that we could not rely on data that we got through the HIE to be able to serve the higher level and the more ambitious purposes that our QDC, our quality data center, was going to need to. So when we turned our data warehouse into a commercial offering, we quickly moved to the model of extracting data directly from EHR systems with the active involvement of the EHR owners rather than as a byproduct of some other primary business model like an HIE. And that's not to, you know, I'm a great supporter of HIEs, but it was just a recognition that those are really different things and we're going to need to offer them in different ways in the market. Um, the last thing is, you know, regarding, you know, how do you make data, um, uh, you know, sort of relevant to anyone at the end of the day? Um, we learned that, you know, the data is only common, is, you know, it only gets better um, useful and usable when it's actually used. Um, it seems like a trivial point, but um, you know, but there are lots of you know sort of examples, ours included, where we didn't make that assumption. So our original QDC model built a warehouse for the purposes of evaluation of the pilot project by Dr. David Bates and the team from Harvard Medical School, um, and we actually had no um, no plan to make that data available to the participating provider organizations, which I'm actually quite embarrassed to, you know, to say that now because it seems like such an obvious thing to do on a number of dimensions, but we just kind of never really thought of it. I mean, we just didn't think that that was, you know, something that was going to be valuable. We thought the HIEs were enough. And no sooner had we gone alive, gone live with it than the providers themselves who are participating in the pilot projects were asking us, why aren't you giving us access to this data? If you're calculating quality measures, we should be able to see that so that we can you know, learn from it. Um, as I said, it embarrasses me to think that we didn't think of that on our own and that it took you know, a lot of feedback from the users. But it's just one example of you know, that you're not going to think of everything and you need users to be able to you know, get access to that. Um, of course, no good deed goes unpunished because the minute that we opened up access to that, we were confronted with questions that we couldn't answer, which was the misalignment of our measure results with what they were getting from other places, um, the workflow difficulties that they had of stepping out of their EHRs to go into our portal, and you know, and and the lack of adoption that we would that we got in our portal as a result, and the often you know very low correlation between common sense and clinical quality measure specifications, which I think many of you, perhaps all of you are well aware of. Um, so, you know, having learned a, a deep lesson in market segmentation, um, you know, we commercialized the, key, the QDC to focus on ACO and, you know, sort of higher level, and I mean that in sort of the food chain, um, customers who, who weren't the um, actual providers themselves, because those organizations are the ones that can align the various analytics efforts going on in their organizations and integrate those results into their their applications um, in a way that was going to make much more sense to the provider organizations. And then finally, they were the ones who could advocate for the importance of paying attention to the CQM results, which you know we ourselves, as just as a technology vendor, had a hard time doing. Um, so I guess the overarching lesson, you know, I would offer that, you know, that we've, you know, sort of it took us 15 years to get to this point, I think, to really know that, you know, that that the that the most important thing is for any, you know, for anyone to know where you are in the value chain. And that was something that we constantly were sort of nimble about through the entire 15 years. Um, we transitioned our organization as, you know, as um, was described, uh, most of it to, you know, to a company called Arcadia, um, because we saw that the part of the value chain that we occupied was rapidly getting commoditized, meaning the ability to just extract clinical data out of EHR systems and do the basic nationally validated CQMs. 
that that was you know quickly becoming a commoditized kind of service and it was going to be difficult for us as a nonprofit without access to lots of capital to either move upstream where you would get more and more customer data and build scale because you need a real sales and marketing team to be able to do that and you know and and again that's access to capital and we also would have difficulty moving downstream where we were where we would need a lot of investment in AI ML capabilities the building of platform business architectures API market infrastructure all those things that are going to be fundamental in my view to um, being able to uh, succeed in the future in this so that's why we decided it was time to transition the organization um, and, uh, and and that's what we did in June um, you know, I think what we've discovered is that healthcare analytics is challenging enough from a data science perspective and embedding it appropriately into decision making and workflows to motivate and enable better outcomes is really a different and even more complex level of the game. And that's the game that, you know, that we would have had a much harder time competing in. So we learned early on that if you build an end to end solution that imposes, you know, our own view uh, uh, onto the, uh, of the world, onto the problem, which is what we did, um, is that our dreams, you know, would get shattered in relatively short order. So we we were nimble, I think, in the sense that we quickly, you know, sort of uncoupled all the things that we did and were able to offer our solution in components or as, you know, sort of a end-to-end -end solution. But again, you know, I think as the market has matured and taken that over, we, you know, we uh, we, we we decided that that was a, a thing that was better, better moved over to, um, you know, to to other our, our other large organizations that had more ability to be able to generate um, to bring to bear the kind of capital and resources that we needed. Um, I would say that going forward, and where we were headed um, was to really think about the business as the platform business and a platform architecture, where you have selectable components, access to immediate results all along the stream, um, with API enablement all along the stream, so that um, so that uh, users can access you know, barely processed data, they can access their raw data, their barely processed data, or their finely processed data, either through your own applications or to applications that they build, that they bring in a, you know, in a, in a self-service kind of way. That's where we were headed. That would be my advice to anyone who's undertaking this today is to, you know, fully embrace that API-based world that we're slowly entering now. Um, and, and again, not only from a technology perspective, but even more important from a business and philosophical perspective, because it really is, I think, a very different way of thinking about the problem and one that is going to be best suited to the future. Um, you know, one of the things and, you know, and um, just to wrap up that, you know, that we learned was that, you know, that the best business um, wasn't going to be the one that came up with the best solution for a given point in time. It turns out that it was going to be the one that could create the best solutions for whatever the world throws at you. And as we've seen over the, over the last 15 years, the world throws stuff at you that is very hard to predict <laughs> and very hard to anticipate. And by the time it's there, it's really hard to build something new. So you got to be able to adapt to it. Um, I, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Nato for, um, for this award and, and thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Craig and Larry as well. We're uh, very pleased to have this uh, award go to uh, such a deserving organization. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for everyone. Thanks for your attendance. And there are networking sessions going on right now. If anybody is interested in meeting new people and networking, now would be a great time. Thank you, everyone, and, and we'll, see, we'll see you soon.